Hello, everyone. This is The Clearing, Episode 1, titled in honor of Toni Morrison and all the great Black women writers and healers that have paved the way. I'm Sawika Colbert, and I'll be your host. The Clearing is a set of conversations in three episodes that explore the themes of Erica Dickerson Dispenza's play, Shadowland. The play, set during Hurricane Katrina, depicts a woman named Ruth trying to convince her mother, Magalie, to sell Shadowland, the family business. Shadowland is New Orleans' first air-conditioned hotel and dance hall for Black people. As Ruth tries to convince her mother to move on, the raging storms force both women to consider what they are willing to let go. During this episode, you'll hear from the creative team of Shadowland about the origins of the play and its transformation into an audio drama, starting with Erica Dickerson Dispenza. The process of creating a play about apocalypse while experiencing apocalypse, <laughs> it's otherworldly. There are times that I've found it very difficult to write because I'm like, I'm writing right now, but about another time. While also examining my own longings and seeing all the Black women in my life also examine their desires and their possessions. I think that in this time of COVID-19, we have drawn on the reservoir of Black cultural formations and art, right? It has actually kept us laughing. If we think about the memes that were created during the election, <laughs> if we, you know, if we think about the films that we are anticipating um, and, the, and the ones that we have, you know, been able to, to watch. For me, coming out of this process, noting just how resilient Black art and Black cultural workers who are squarely centering their efforts on revolution and shifting our notion of what is possible in our world, how imperative it is to continue in that Black radical tradition. We're doing a play, but we're also talking about ourselves and also talking about the world all at the same time. We'll have something to let the record show. This is what we were doing at this time. And it's deeply personal and also a deep offering. That was Lily Award-winning director of Shadowland, Candace Jones. In my conversations with Erica and Candace, I asked about the process of making a play about catastrophe amidst catastrophe. It began with the postponement of another one of Erica's plays, Colored Water. I slid into Erica's instant messenger on Facebook, I think in 2018. She just got the Lark Fellowship and I read her bio and I was like, who is this person? Her work sounds fascinating. Is she doing a whole 10 play Katrina cycle? Wow, how epic. She invited me to do her very, very early workings of Colored Water. After that first development reading, we went out to drinks and I was like, so what you want to do with this play? Let's get it. Let's do it. It's funny. I had quit my job as an assistant executive director of a Black women's uh, organization in Brooklyn. And instead of looking for another full-time job, I had decided to allow myself to be a full-time artist for the first time in my life. And the day that I quit, I attended the Fire This Time Festival. And I see this girl uh, after the show, and I didn't know Candace at the time. And literally that night or the next morning, I have this message from her introducing herself. And... I was looking for Black women directors to work with on this fledgling of a play. Candace was the director for my second uh, roundtable reading of, of Color Water at the Lark. And after the reading, I'm thinking like, okay, you know, maybe we'll be brief or whatever. She's like, you want to go to dinner? And so we go to this Thai restaurant um, up the street from the Lark. And, and she literally says, so what do you want to do with this play? Because we have to do something with this play. And so Candace sent that play to Jack Moore, who at the time uh, was a dramaturg in the New Works Department at the Public Theater. And he called me the morning after he read the play and said, I would like to meet with you. And in my first meeting with Jack, I said the same thing to him that I said to Candace, that I want this play up within the next year. It is my requirement to have a Black woman director that I would like to continue to work with Candace on it. Um, and yeah, we kind of took off from there. So Colored Water is said to be staged at the public. 
the pandemic happens. So Color Water is not staged. It was really interesting when the public, like a lot of theaters, entered the pandemic and we were no longer able to produce live theater. That's Jack Moore, the director of New Artists at the Public Theater. We are suddenly improvising of like, okay, what does theater mean? You know, we started doing plays on Zoom. We were slated to do Richard II in Shakespeare in the Park. We, you know, teamed up with WNYC and made it an audio drama. But then as soon as... Andre Holland starts talking into my ears. I was like, oh, this is something completely different. It's not Shakespeare in the Park. It's not outside in the middle of New York City, but it's there's an intimacy and a privacy to it and a vulnerability to it. And so when we were considering, okay, what else can we do in these, in an audio medium, who are the artists that we trust implicitly, who we know will kind of be up for the challenge of navigating this with us. And Erica was the first person that I called. So Oscar Eustace calls me up and Oscar says, you know, I think Shadowland is really ripe for uh, audio production. What do you think of that? And I said, no, (laughs) because I was not interested in creating audio plays. And then we negotiated a bit. Shadowland, the audio play is set in New Orleans which epitomizes a tale of two city histories, one of cultural investment, the other of state divestment. What lessons does the history of the city teach us as we navigate ongoing infrastructural breaches across the country? We'll first hear from Amani Perry, the Hughes Rogers Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. The Gulf Coast is the front line of disaster in our history. Um, And that goes back to it being the site, the kind of primary site of the transatlantic slave trade. And then over generations, the encounter with the physical vulnerability of the disaster of the landscape, of course, grows sharper with uh, climate change and the building of New Orleans has always been shaped by reducing the vulnerability for the relatively affluent and white populations and increasing the vulnerability of of Black folk. You know, the play captures this really um, in an extraordinarily profound and beautiful way. Um, There is the echo of disastrous past, in particular Hurricane Betsy in 1965. Betsy was the worst um, until Katrina. And so there's this, there's these, all these levels of haunting um, that shape the present, right? And that are connected to infrastructure and governmental policy um, and also have this kind of spiritual dimension as well. Here's Kara Page a Black queer feminist cultural memory worker, curator, and organizer. I want to place myself that I was in Atlanta, Georgia during Hurricanes Katrina and then Rita. And so many of us experiencing, witnessing um, what I call the national live lynchings on television during that time and how the response of the state, uh, the government, for both federal and state, responded to Black communities, Vietnamese and, and immigrant communities, incarcerated people, elders and youth, LGBTQ, just failing um, the dignity um, and the humanity of our people as we tried to survive, uh, as they tried to survive after that storm, right? So everyone says the natural disaster of Hurricane Katrina, and I say, oh no, the natural disaster of the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And as portrayed in this beautiful play by Erica, it speaks to how, as Black people, are rooted in plates. And that there is, uh, New Orleans is, a, in particular, in the South, a spiritual ancestral core to our legacies, our history of survival from slavery, our histories of music, of culture, that are so deeply intertwined in a spiritual legacy of the survival of Black people. Um, So uh, being a site of history and memory, New Orleans speaks to, even in its existence, despite infrastructural breaches. So to exist, New Orleans has had to keep memory and history and its lands and its waters and its music and culture so defined. It's a difficult task to write about New Orleans culturally because I'm very aware of how 
easily we are smitten with uh, the idea of New Orleans being exceptional as a city. We think about Congo Square and New Orleans jazz, New Orleans brass. We think about second lining. All of these um, icons within New Orleans Black culture that can easily make us be like, oh, well, New Orleans is unlike any city. And then that prevents us from seeing the underbelly of the city. So I was really interested in um, highlighting what is beautiful and also that much of that beauty comes with and out of struggle, like any other Black city in America, right? I think Candace, you know, did a beautiful job of of kind of showing this in a prismatic way uh, for the audio rendition. When you think about um, how sonic this play is, that is the main line of communication. The way that the play is in, in conversation with the history of jazz in New Orleans is super unique. And so I knew that I needed to work with a composer who was deeply connected to the jazz culture in New Orleans and, and musicians in New Orleans. Um, and so I was really honored to talk to Delphio Marcellus, who is part of a huge family of musicians. And so in talking to him, we talked about the history of jazz in New Orleans. And then I started to find parallels between that history and the character Magalie in the play and how she wants to really preserve her legacy and her family history um, and connects through that particular preservation and value through sound. Music has a nostalgia quality, a way of drawing the listener back to a specific place and time. Amani, what role does art play in reclamation in reclaiming what has been lost? In the context of, um, you know, disaster like Katrina, people lose photographs and all kinds of precious documents. And then there's a question of what, what does one do with that? How does one hold on to the history and hold on to identity when so much is lost? And then you also have the Katrina diaspora and so many people are displaced. And I do think art uh, gives us a way to tell that story. And there's a sense in which the loss, the narration of the loss itself becomes a different mode of a memorialization. Erica, thinking of memory and memorialization, when we enter Shadowland, are we in the past, present, or future? Wow, it depends on which character perspective we're talking about. The play is grounded in August 29th to September 3rd of 2005. And what that feels like for Ruth is very different than what that feels like for Magalie. And Magalie has this 60-year memory of this establishment and this neighborhood and can retrieve the memories with ease. It is almost as though they happened yesterday for her. And in addition to that, she has the longer memory of what this piece of land means for the Dispenza family. Uh, the immigrants who came and married these Black Creole women, she can run off the history of this particular land from colonial times to present day. And Ruth is saying, I know this history, but what I feel most deeply is this contemporary moment that we are in and how I am experiencing um, this gift of land and legacy as a burden because of all that comes with it in this particular time. What Ruth is able to access uh, in a more embodied way, though, is dance and the rhythms of the space and of the city. And so, whereas for Magali, it is the horn, it is the trombone, it is ragtime jazz and brass. For Ruth, it is the drum, it is the pulse of the city, it is the heartbeat of our people. We're joined again by Kara Page. Well, I just want to name the character Magali, who doesn't want to leave Shadowland, doesn't want to close it. It is not just the creation of music, of culture, of Black people that we're talking about. We're talking about the legacy and lineage of what the past remembers, what ancestral traditions we are bringing forward as, as a salve 
as resiliency, as political and cultural survival for our people. Um, my people are actually of um, Black Seminole Nation in Florida, um, and I do a lot of work on remembering and honoring that lineage. I know many people uh, rooted and connected to the historical legacies of New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, right? and what it has meant to survive attempted genocide of our people and white supremacist institutions, uh, let alone violence and slavery. Um, so music and art, visual art, Shadowland itself, the memory and sound and tradition and vibration, right, of a people in this building that in this hotel that she will not leave because it is her, but she embodies this time portal. We have to hold the line for the memory and the protection of our people. And I do think that is the role of art. That is the role of visual, uh, spiritual, political, cultural art that tells the story, that, but also ties the past to the portal of the present, to the portal of the future. The imagery of a time portal draws forth the depiction of the bar transforming into Congo Square in the play. Congo Square, a place for the enslaved to gather, to sing, dance, and play music. In addition, the enslaved could buy and sell goods in the square in order to raise money to buy their freedom. In the 21st century, Congo Square continues to be a historical site for community gathering, a place for brass band parades, protest marches, drum circles, and past presences. Amani Perry considered the presence of the past in the play. There's something that is happening beyond the realm of the sort of material world, right? And when you occupy the landscape of um, of ancestors who were enslaved, there's a reality in the U.S. South that that's always, there's always this sort of past presence, right? Politically, of course, and historically, but also at a spiritual level. And you can get snatched into that. I do think that that's a really kind of a, a beautiful and extraordinary way that the play considers spirit possession. If we think about sort of the history of Black theater, there's moments like, you know, the way that August Wilson engages with spirit possession. This is a distinct rendering, and it's very, it's it's a beautifully distinct rendering under, and it undergirds the entire play, right? And it connects to desire and aspiration and... Are there certain pasts we should not pass on? And of course, I'm riffing here on, on the end of Beloved, Toni Morrison's Beloved. And in Beloved, there's a doubleness there, the story not to pass on to tell in the midst of telling the story. Um, and a story not, you can also read it as a story not to pass on as in, in the sense of not to pass by telling it, right? And I think that's the case here as well. I mean, it goes back to your point about the significance of art, because there are things, there are parts of the story that we don't want to pass on in the sense of how we live our lives, but the story still needs to be told, right? It's a work of art. It's a pruning. It's a like a pulling through the particular threads about inheritance and place and, you know, what Shadowland was, what it was made into, you know, as, as opposed to a, a site of suffering, a site of, of pleasure and joy, right? And this question of what sort of letting go of something, but perhaps not forgetting it. And it's not tidally resolved. The answer is not resolved. In some ways, the weather makes the decision. Um, but I think the question itself is, we always live with it. It's part of the condition of Black people. The pasts we should not pass on, are both national, communal, and personal. Lauren Whitehead, dramaturgical consultant, joined us to consider, and riffing on another Black woman writer, Audre Lorde, the uses of the erotic past in Shadowland. I did not read well enough. I do think it's worth it to just say for a second that in our sort of dramaturgical work with Erica, we worked really hard on Ruth's desire. We worked really, really hard on Ruth's desire because the presence of Ruth's queerness is 
newish, right? It seems like it's something that was always in Erica's head, but didn't always live in the play. And I don't want to say that we had to give her permission, but that was like, you're allowed to, to let this character be queer. And then when the allowance for the queerness of the character came through, there was sort of this dichotomy that was built, right? That was like, well, if she's queer, she's always been in the closet and her relationship with Ernie was never real. Like there was always this um, inherent sort of, I don't know, bisexual or pansexual or queer erasure in the thing that meant that if you desired one thing, that the substance of your other desire was false or petty or minor or lesser or subservient or something else. And so we worked really hard to not make Ruth's relationships with Frankie and Ernie in competition with one another or ranked against one another or um, or that the that her desire for Frankie meant that she had no appreciation for Ernie or no desire for Ernie, right? That there's something about the expansiveness of the desire that needed some permission or some allowance. And that is something that I don't know that even our queer ancestors made space for in their writing, right? So I don't think that it's something about letting go, but it is about expansion. It's the work that we do as the new vanguard to say, yes, thank you, Tony. Yes, thank you, Audrey. Yes, thank you, June. Yes, 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 thank you, and both. And you keep telling us we can't have our cake and eat it too, but I made two cakes, right? So it's like, there's something about what this play is trying to do about the expanding the shape and the potential for desire to move exponentially in both directions that both Erica was like afraid to take on. And also I think everybody else is a little bit afraid to acknowledge, right? But here it is, here it is. And Erica's play is trying to subvert that and challenge that and to say that we need to maybe leave behind our limiting notions of desire and our limiting notions of marriage, our limiting notions of relationship so that we can move forward into more innovative ways of conceptualizing relationships or conceptualizing desire. And so it's hard to talk about this because when we're talking about desire in a different time, in a different way, in a different manner, and it doesn't mean that there even those theories of desire or, you know, um, Audre Lorde's, you know, uses of the erotic are still useful as we come up with new versions of those, of usefulness for the erotic. So I think I'm just... I'm just hoping I'm saying this in a way that honors my <laughs> reverence for our ancestors and also says that we have to build on that to find a way to live newly with our increasing modicums of freedom. Like as we get more freedom all the time, we need to have more theories about what to do with that freedom and how to use it responsibly. And I think that's what the play is trying to do. You did the reading. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. It's not... Erica's fault that there is a, a sense of scarcity, particularly when it comes to sexuality um, in American culture. Uh, but she has to put her foot down and say, no, forget about other ways you may think about sexuality, the way you may think of partnership, the way you may think about relationship. This is how we're going to think about it. And it's, yeah, I know you've heard a bunch of other stories that are more limited, but be with me in this space. Let's imagine, let's, let's imagine that this character is not engaging in an either or enterprise here, that what she's trying to find is a, is a, a bigger fullness. I have so many thoughts about this particular question. The arc of black history from being stolen to being on this particular land of the, the continental U S uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that William Faulkner uh, line, the past is never dead. It's not even past thinking about it in transatlantic time, right? Christina Sharp teaches us it's like this continuum of time that is not linear for us because of our particular positioning in this country. Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking about like how our access to the past is always mediated by our experiences of it directly and indirectly. And so what did America learn from Hurricane Katrina and the state-sanctioned man-made disaster that we know as the flood? The COVID-19 pandemic shows us that very little has changed. 
This has been The Clearing, Episode 1. The conversation included Erica Dickerson Dispenza, playwright, Candace Jones, director, Jack Moore, director of New Artists at the Public Theater, Amani Perry, the Hughes Rogers Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University, Kara Page, Black queer feminist cultural memory worker, curator, and organizer, Lauren Whitehead, Shadowland dramaturgical consultant, and me, your host, Suika Colbert, Idol Family Professor of African American Studies and Performing Arts at Georgetown University. Join us for episode two, which explores how catastrophes are created and what imaginative and constructive work needs to be done to prevent them in the future.